Natural Museum and History Society Community Program. I'm Larry Stevens, President of the Society, and again I welcome you. Thanks for coming out this evening on a cold night, but we're all thankful. I'm sure that it's not as cold as it was last night, because I have a feeling the crowd would be a little bit thinner this evening. But, uh, so thank you all for coming out. We're trying something new tonight. We're broadcasting tonight's program live on the internet on Facebook Live. For those folks who live out of the area or who are just unable to join us here tonight for whatever reason. So we are hoping that all runs smoothly. And uh, so welcome to our Facebook folks out there and welcome again to all of you. Before we begin our, begin our program this evening though, in accordance with the bylaws of the society, an annual meeting of its members is to be held at the first meeting of the year. So we'll have that at this time very briefly. And if you all, I'll call the meeting to order and if you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And then remain standing, please. I believe to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you remain standing, please, as is, has been our custom, uh, at this time we will, we will observe a moment of silence in memory of those members of the society that we have lost in the past year. They are member Jean L. Slaughter Flossdorf, member Russell M. Rook, charter member Margaret Peg D. Weaver, charter member Harry S. Reinhardt Jr., charter member William E. Forrest, and charter member and former board member Linford Shoemaker. Thank you. you. May be seated. We would normally at this time have the reading of the annual report of the board of directors for 2018, but uh, and I'd like to give you, like to make up some uh, good excuse that, that I'm doing this to uh, cut down on time. But I was, quite simply, I forgot to bring them with us this evening. So, <laughs> so we'll, we won't be having those this evening, and I'll include a copy of those in with our next newsletter, so everyone has a has a copy of that. I do want to announce that all the records of the society, such as minutes and financial records, are available to its members on request at any time throughout the year. So if there's anything you want to know about the society, just let us know. And I also want to announce that the books and records of the treasurer for the year 2017 were audited in 2018 by auditors Steve Kive and John Stevens and everything found to be in order. Is there any other business of the members to be brought up at this time? If not, this meeting's adjourned. Yeah, that was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, I have just a few announcements before we begin the, the program tonight. Our next community program will be on Tuesday, April 2nd, so make a note of that. Uh, it normally would be held at the end of uh, March, but since I have another commitment, uh, um, we're going to move that up to Tuesday, April 2nd. And at that time, I'll, I will be presenting the 10th annual edition of This and That, an eclectic look at Hatfield history. Just a bunch of uh, random pictures, um, none of them having you know, necessarily to do with the other, uh, but just great old photographs uh, to uh, display Hatfield's history. Um, after the program, come up and check out our books, DVDs, and other great items we have for sale. We have a brand new booklet of last, uh, our last program, The Right Conspiracy. So if you missed that program or if you just enjoyed that program a lot and would like a copy of that, come up and uh, pick that up afterwards if you like. If you paid your membership dues already, uh, you may see Debbie afterwards and pick up your membership card. And if you haven't and you'd like to uh, pay her, you can do that at that time. And if you are not a member yet and would like to join us, we would certainly... Uh, appreciate your support uh, of, of the society by becoming a member. It's only $10, so um, you can do see Debbie afterwards for that as well. Um, please join me in thanking those who provide refreshments for us this evening, Kitty Heckler, June Detweiler, Ray Masser, and Kevin Kriebel, and thank you very much.
At the end of the program, before you leave, we're gonna have a card up front here for Dale Moyer. Um, Dale's going through a rough time now, and uh, but he's doing a lot better than he was uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, so he's, he's improving uh, daily, it seems. So keep uh, Dale in your thoughts and prayers, and if you can stop up and sign this card afterwards, uh, that'd be great. And I think that's about it, so uh, I'll just dim the lights and we'll begin our program. program I've titled Faith of Our Fathers, and in it we will take a look at the various churches that were started by the early settlers of Hatfield. I suppose I could have more accurately titled the program Faith of Our Founders, but Lansdale Society did a program with that title a number of years ago, and I try not to copy their program titles if I can avoid it. Now, this will certainly not be a comprehensive history of these early churches. That would take many, many hours. As it is, this may be one of our longer programs, so I have it whittled down to what I hope are the most interesting parts. And with a little luck, you'll all stay awake and learn a few things uh, about our local churches that you didn't know before. To begin, tonight, to begin tonight's program, let's go back in time to the mid-1600s and across the Atlantic to England. Now, when I start back that far, you know it's gonna be a long program. So, Although born into a distinguished English family, William Penn, at the age of 22, reject, rejected the beliefs of the established Church of England and joined the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers. Penn's religious views were extremely distressing to his parents, and in 1668, at the age of 24, Penn was even imprisoned for his religious writings. The young Penn's religious views effectively exiled him from the English society. He was expelled from Christ Church, Oxford, for being a Quaker, and he was arrested several times. The persecution of Quakers in England became so fierce that Penn decided that it would be better for him to try to start a new free Quaker settlement in North America. Some Quakers had already moved to North America, but the New England Puritans, especially, were as negative toward Quakers as the people back home. In 1677, though, a group of prominent Quakers, Penn being among them, received the colonial province of West New Jersey, which was about half the size uh, of the state of uh, current New Jersey. Four years later, in 1681, King Charles II of England granted William Penn a large tract of land that was west of New Jersey. The king made this land grant to settle a large debt that he had with Penn's deceased father. William Penn originally called the area Sylvania, which is Latin for forest, wood, forest land or woods, but King Charles changed it to Pennsylvania in honor of Penn's father who he had held in high esteem. William Penn came to North America the following year in 1682 and established the province of Pennsylvania as a place where people could enjoy freedom of religion. This map shows Penn's original land grant. The first county settled in Pennsylvania was called Bucks County, named after the county of Buckinghamshire in England where the Penn's family home was, and from where many of Pennsylvania's first settlers came. The other two counties are two Chester and three Philadelphia. Although the King's Highway, or Bethlehem Pike, was completed through Philadelphia County in 1714 to the Bucks County Line, where the village of Line Lexington is today, it wasn't until around 1730 that white folks really started to settle in this land that would eventually become Hatfield Township. These early settlers were of Welsh extraction, 
and located in the southern section of the township. These early Welsh settlers were mostly Baptists with a few Quakers. And you may remember from our last program that one of the early settlers in the area was John Wright, an English Quaker who settled here in 1725. His sons, of course, later orchestrated an attack on a colonial militia officer here in Hatfield, which became known as the Wright Conspiracy. <laughs> The remaining area of the future township was settled by the Germans, who were predominantly Mennonites and Dunkers, with a few Lutherans and Reform. The History of Montgomery County, written in 1884, notes that there was quite a large Mennonite population in the country at that time. And the first dedicated house of worship, or church, built in Hatfield, was by the Mennonites. It was around 1765 that Henry Fry sold the Mennonites a small corner of his farm on which to establish a cemetery and to build a house to be used as a school and for worshiping purposes. This house was a log structure built in the corner of the present cemetery site located at Welsh Road and Orvilla Road. Now it is assumed by, by many when hearing the name Plains Mennonite that the name has some association to the term Plain Folk, often associated with the Amish Mennonite. Actually, the name comes from the fact that this area of Hatfield Township is said by some sources to be the most level in eastern Pennsylvania. Early settlers called this area the Plains because of its lack of hills. As with all Mennonite meeting houses of this time, this church was a plain, unpretentious structure. Comforts and necessary conveniences were provided for, but all ornate embellishments, inside and out, were strictly avoided. The original log house stood until about 1814, when it was demolished and a new one built of stone. A third stone meeting house, covered in plaster, this one seen here, was erected in, in 1867. This photo, taken around 1920, shows the church building as seen from Orvilla Road. Here's another circa 1920 photo showing the front of the 1867 meeting house. Notice the horse sheds to the rear on the right side of the photo. And Orvilla Road is running between the fences seen here. This photo from around the same time shows the back side of the church, and I assume that that small building in the back there is probably the outhouse. <laughs> in 1922, this building was demolished, and a new stone and plaster meeting house was constructed. This photo shows the 1922 building after a basement addition was constructed in the 1940s. Here's another photo of the 1922 meeting house as seen from Orvilla Road. The covered porch shields the two entrances to the meeting house. As was the custom with most conservative Mennonite churches of that time, men and women sat separately during the service. So the door on the left was used by men and boys, and the door on the right was used by women and children. Also under the porch roof is a hand water pump and a single enamelware drinking cup for the use of the congregation or for anyone passing by needing to quench their thirst. Here's a nice artist rendition of the old 1922 meeting house in the winter. I'm not sure what the artist based this on as I have not come across any early photos of the meeting house without a porch roof and with a side entrance, but it's still a nice painting nonetheless. In 1960, the front covered porch was removed and a small addition added to the Orvilla Road end of the church and a large addition was constructed onto the back of the building. This is how the building looked after the 1960 renovations. 
1989, the building was once again enlarged when another addition was constructed to the back of the building. And this is a recent view of Plains Mennonite from Orbella Road. And a recent photo of the rather new side entrance of the meeting house. If you're not a Hatfield long timer, you may not even be aware of the historic Frick's Meeting House and Cemetery. It sits quite a distance from the street on Easter Hill Road, across from the Twin Woods Golf Course. The cemetery dates back to the 1740s. It was in 1740 that Jacob Shooter purchased a large piece of land, about 250 acres, in what would soon become Hatfield Township. A time came when Mr. Shooter granted a small piece of his land to the Society of Mennonites to establish a burial ground. An old conveyance stated that, quote, a small plot between a small gut or gully and Beaver Creek is set aside as a burying ground for the Society of Mennonites with the privileges of a road along the line from the west corner of the farm to the burying grounds." End quote. What exact year this conveyance was made is uncertain, but although the Plains Mennonite Meeting House established the first church in Hatfield, the Frick Cemetery is believed to be the first Mennonite cemetery in the area, preceding the opening of the burial grounds at the Plains Meeting House, in 1765, and even preceding the Line Lexington Mennonite Meeting House Cemetery in 1752. So the land for Frick Cemetery was probably given sometime between 1740 and 1752. The Mennonites mostly enjoyed, enjoyed harmony here in the New World until 1774 when the trouble started between the American colonies and England. The Mennonites, being non-resistant in doctrine, were looked at by the colonial revolutionaries as Tories, or supporters of the British. And because of this, they often suffered the loss of some of their best horses, cattle, and grain. But since they did not show any signs of hostility to the government or the army, they were not threatened physically. But the different views held by the leaders of the Mennonite Church on the question of the oath of allegiance and the payment of taxes demanded by Congress caused much strife in the Mennonite Church. Christian Funk, a bishop at Franconia Mennonite during the Revolution, was an intelligent man. He studied the Constitution of the new United States government, and quite simply, his point of view was very different from most Mennonites, and he was excommunicated from the church because of this. So what he and his followers did was they held their own services in the church when it wasn't being used by the main group. This was soon put in, to an end, however, and they were locked out of the church with guards stationed to deny entrance. After this, Funk's group began worshiping in houses and barns in the area. Christian Funk died in 1811 at the age of 80. After his death, Christian Funk's followers, known as Funkites, built four houses of worship in Montgomery County. One of them in Hatfield Township on our villa, on our villa road on the Mennonite Cemetery property. How the Funkites got permission to build there is uncertain, but since the regular Mennonites had houses of worship and cemeteries in Line Lexington and on the other side of Hatfield Township at Plains, it seems that there was just little interest in what happened with this cemetery property. The first house of worship was built here on the cemetery property around 1812, and for a number of years, the Funkites prospered. But without the strong leadership of its founder, Christian Funk, 
the flock became divided. It seems that between 1820 and 1880, many Funkites united with the German Baptist Brethren, and some returned to the main Mennonite body. But four Hatfield families remained steadfast. The Rosenbergers, the Funks, the Fricks, and the Wiremans. About 1880, there was an effort of revival for the church spearheaded by Bishop Henry H. Rosenberger, Daniel Rosenberger, and Peter Frick. Peter Frick owned the farm adjoining the cemetery. In 1882, Peter Frick donated land next to the cemetery to the church on which to build a new meeting house. This new meeting house became known as Frick's Meeting House and the cemetery Frick Cemetery. For a number of years, union services were occasionally held with the German Baptist Brethren and the Mennonites joining the Funkites for worship. But after the union services were discontinued, a period of neglect followed and the church sat empty. Around 1900, the church received a new slate roof, but reportedly tramps used the building as a hangout for a number of years. The last burial in the cemetery was that of David Rosenberger of the village of Unionville in 1903. William F. Rosenberger, a Mennonite Hatfield farmer and founder of Rosenberger Dairies, was instrumental in maintaining the meeting house, meeting house during the early decades of the 1900s, when there was little interest or financial support for doing so. In 1941, a member of the Rosenberger family, A.C. Rosenberger, developed an interest in the old Frick's meeting house. With the support of other members of the Rosenberger family, in 1942, the church was cleaned up and repaired. In August of that year, a reunion and song service was held at the church, with response being beyond expectation. In 1958, Raymond and Sally Rosenberger purchased additional land adjacent to the meeting house and donated it to the church. An additional 12 acres was purchased in 1977 to help ensure the solitude of the church and cemetery. Members of the Rosenberger family continue to service the upkeep and maintenance of this historic meeting house. The annual reunion at the meeting house for song services continued until at least 1982. I'm not certain if they're still held, are they Marcus? But the, re the reunions at the meeting house, are they still held? Okay, great. Uh, the, um, this picture is a little fuzzy. This was taken uh, in May 2017 when the Mennonite Heritage Center hosted a song service at the Meeting House. And the Meeting House, from what I understand, uh, remains untouched by modern conveniences. So I guess it still doesn't have electric or plumbing or any of those good things. It's still pretty rustic. And a place to hang your hat. A place to hang your hat. <laughs> Very simple. It's not known where the early German Baptist brethren or dunkers of Hatfield worship, but it is possibly in local homes. German Baptists have been persecuted in Germany under the name Anabaptists or Rebaptizers. They were a very religious, devoted people, differing little from the Mennonites, except in the ritual of baptism. The German Bapt Baptists always administer baptism by what is called trine, immer trine immersion, where the penitent is dipped three times face downward in the name of the Trinity, hence the name Dunkers, or sometimes Dippers. Like all denominations bearing the name of Baptist, 
the German Baptists rejected infant baptism as unscriptural. Originally, it was a custom for the baptisms to be administered, quote, in a running stream of clear water, end quote. Over the, mo over the many years of the church's history, baptism has taken place in many different places throughout Hatfield. The railroad bridge in the borough, the Mashamney Creek between the borough and the church, at Beaver Creek, next to Frick's Meeting House, Frank Munsinger's Pond, and a stream in Alabox Meadow. It was not unusual to have to break the ice in these creeks for winter baptisms, but no one ever reportedly became sick by being baptized in the icy cold water. It is known that as early as September 1839, Hatfield's German Baptist started holding services in the eight corner or eight square schoolhouse that was located near the intersection of Orbilla Road and Coffell Road. These services were held every two weeks by preachers of other congregations. <coughs> Apparently, a big revival was held by the congregation in the early 1840s, which created a great desire to move forward with building a meeting house. In 1844, George Fisher donated land on Calpeth Road to the German Baptists for a meeting house. Excuse me. Although the congregation numbering 25 members was not immediately ready to build a new meeting house, Members brought lumber to the site and built church seats beneath the big white oak trees on the property. The first sermon on the property was preached during an open air service under the large oaks. I think, excuse me, I'm going to have to take a little break. <clears throat> I might have to sit down and do this. When I stand for too long, my nerve in my hip starts bothering me. <laughs> you don't mind if I sit there? Yeah. was built in 1850 of brick and measured about 30 by 40 feet. A cemetery was laid out next to the meeting house and the first burial was held in 1854. The first meeting house building stood for 17 years until 1867. By that year the building had become too small for the growing congregation so it was decided to build a new church. The old church was demolished and the brick from the first meeting house was used to build the new meeting house. In 1894, three men from the church constructed a gravel and cinder footpath from the church to the edge of Hatfield Borough. The path was about two feet higher than the road and served as a great convenience for many years for people walking from town and from the trolley to the church. The community also greatly appreciated this footpath. This picture, taken around 1905, is our oldest photograph of the meeting house. That's John Munsinger Sr. seen standing outside the church. Mr. Munsinger owned a farm on Cowpath Road just a few hundred yards south of the meeting house, and he was a charter member of the church. 
Notice the horse sheds behind the church on the right side of the picture. The sheds were built in 1887, and each member built his own shed. The owner's name was then affixed to each shed. These horse sheds stood until they were torn down in 1934. Also notice that there are three doors in the side of the building. This building served the congregation well until 1906, when a large addition was constructed. Notice the meeting house now has four doors. There is also a kerosene lantern on a post to help light the way to the church. You can also see, by this time, the congregation was known as German Baptist Brethren. This photo, taken in 1907, shows the other side of the 1867 meeting house with the dirt Cowpath Road at the front of the picture. The tent scene here was set up next to the church to accommodate the feeding of a large crowd that attended the Eastern PA District meeting held there. In 1908, the name of the church was officially changed from German Baptist Brethren to Church of the Brethren. The congregation continued to grow, and by 1928, with 182 members, it had once again outgrown its building. A new meeting house was erected and dedicated in September 1928. This photo, I believe, was taken shortly after it was built in 1928. In 1936, a concrete pool was built next to the church for baptisms, although some people still chose to be baptized in a creek. It was the duty of the church deacons to heat water and carry it out to fill the pool. This photo, taken during the district meeting of 1941, shows a rather packed out parking lot behind the church. And I believe that this photo of the church is from around 1950. The closing of the Mansdale Brethren Church in 1950 resulted in an increase in attendance at the Hatfield Church. Additions to both ends of the building were constructed to accommodate the incre increase in membership. And an indoor baptismal pool was built at the front of the church. As I mentioned previously, a cemetery was laid out next to the original meeting house, and the first burial, burial was held in 1854. One notable figure, I said notable figure, was buried in the cemetery is Jesse B. Aiken. Mr. Aiken, born in 1818, and his wife, Elner, lived on a Hatfield Township farm and attended the Brethren Church. Mr. Aiken holds a place in music history in that he is the inventor of the seven character notes, or scale, in music, and was the first to successfully produce a songbook with the seven shape note system. This was in 1846, and I would say that makes him notable. <laughs> My notes here says, pause here for raucous laughter. <laughs> Obviously, that wasn't needed. <laughs> Mr. Aiken's wife, Eleanor, died in 1883 at the age of 57, and Jesse died 17 years later in 1900 at the age of 92. According to Alibach's 1944 History of Hatfield, even though Jesse Aiken was issued a patent for his music notes invention, he died a poor man, and no tombstone even marked his grave for many years until this tombstone was added sometime later. The Evangelical Association denomination, sometimes called German Methodist, was founded in 1800. The early preachers of this group were circuit riders. Circuit riding preachers were very common in the early years of the Methodist Church. A circuit was often 200 to 500 miles around, 
and the rider was expected to complete the course in two to six weeks. This pace was always hectic. The circuit riding preacher would go only a few miles before stopping to set up another meeting. He might preach two or three times a day. This, of course, meant that meetings happened on any day of the week, not just on Sundays. While at a stop, the preacher would also visit as many of the local families as possible, usually sharing a hymn and a prayer. They established prayer meeting classes, which later developed into organized congregations. There were relatively few days of rest in the circuit riding preacher's schedule. This ensured that most people would see the Methodist preacher about once a month. The denomination grew to be quite large, with churches in many parts of the country. Here in Hatfield, the German Methodists first met in private homes. In December 1853, a one and a half acre plot of land on our Villa Road was given for a church building and a cemetery. In the summer of 1854, the Evangelical Association constructed their first church building on the property. That building served the congregation well until 1876 when it was removed and a new building constructed, this one seen here, which still stands today. That makes this church building the oldest church building standing in Hatfield. In 1891, the Evangelical Association denomination started experiencing difficulties. There was a division between two factions in the denomination. This division in the denomination also caused a division in the Hatfield Church. But for a number of years, even though they had their differences, both groups continued to use the Orvilla Church building, presumably at different times. <laughs> In 1984, however, that changed and the majority of the members of the congregation left the church, leaving the property in the hands of the minority. The members that left then built a new house of worship on Cowpath Road in the village of Hatfield. This new church was known as the United Evangelical Church, and you'll hear more about them in a little while. After the division, the membership of the Evangelical Association Church numbered less than 16. They continued worshiping there, though, and in 1922, 31 years after the division, the United Evangelical Denomination and the Evangelical Association Denominations decided to reunite. It's unclear just how long the church continued holding services here, but they were eventually discontinued and the building was sold in 1932. Behind the church sits a three-quarter acre cemetery. The first burial was made in this cemetery in January 1853. And according to a sign posted there, the cemetery is now owned by the Christ United Methodist Church in Lansdale. Little is known about the early history of the Bethany Bible Fellowship Church. It is known that the original church building was built around 1880 by the Mennonite General Conference and was referred to for the first few years as the Hatfield New Mennonite Church. The church was built on a small dirt road that would eventually become West Broad Street and was described as being just outside the village of Hatfield. In 1883, the church became the Hatfield Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church. Church membership at the Hatfield Church remained low, hardly reaching 25 members. Around 1904, after some of the older members had died and several others moved from the area, Regular services here were discontinued, and the, and the building stood idle for many years. It was reported, quote, 
The forlorn church, church building, door left ajar, had birds flying in and out of the broken windows. <laughs> Sunday school records were left as they had been, end quote. Even though regular services were discontinued, special services, such as revival meetings and baptisms, were occasionally held. The October 31, 1907 edition of the Hatfield Times reported that the NBC Church had, the NBC Church had held a baptism in the South Hatfield Creek. This photo, showing a group of young ladies sledding on West Broad Street in front of the church, was taken, I believe, in the early 1930s. Initially, the Hatfield Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church shared a pastor with a larger church in Quakertown. In 1913, the pastor appointed to the Quakertown Hatfield Circuit was tragically killed when a trolley hit his car while traveling on pastoral duties closer to Quakertown. In 1919, Pastor Hefner was assigned. Although his primary charge was the Quakertown congregation, Pastor Hefner would travel by trolley to Hatfield for special ministry services. He reportedly carried wood in his suitcase for fire to keep the church building. In 1920, the church building was reopened for temporary use as an emergency schoolroom, leased to the Hatfield Borough School District for use as a primary school. I believe this is possibly a photo of the original church building when it was used as a schoolhouse in the early 1920s. The building was used as a schoolhouse for only a short time, however, uh, and soon the Hatfield Joint Consolidated School was open, and once again, the church building, building fell into disuse. In 1932, the Hatfield Church building was cleaned up, made ready for use, and an afternoon Sunday school was begun. A year later, in 1933, regular Sunday worship services were also being held. In 1934, Reverend Musselman was assigned as the first full-time pastor of the newly reopened church. And records report that in 1935, the average Sunday school attendance was 79. In 1936, a convenience addition was built onto the left side of the original building and used for nursery facilities, extra Sunday school space, and an overflow area for the chapel. It was around this time that the church became known in the community as Little Heaven. In 1940, the church sold a small piece of its land to Hatfield Borough for $225 for the erection of a large water tower. Later, a fire siren was placed on the tower. The occasional sounding of the enormously loud siren during the services always brought giggles from the children. And in later years, the siren sounding became an occasion to stop and pray for the firemen and the families in crisis. In the late 1940s, a bright pink neon sign was placed on the church, declaring that Jesus saves. And of course, that light continues to shine on the front of the church today. In 1950, construction of a Cape Cod-styled house to be used as a parsonage was completed at the corner of Wayne Avenue and Broad Street, right next to the church. In the summers of the early 1950s, the church would transport chairs, a portable organ, and a lectern to Lansdale's Memorial Park for Sunday evening services. The church, of course, had no air conditioning, so access to natural airflow was welcome on those sultry August evenings. Another practical reason to relocate the services in the summer was the presence of the Hatfield Speedway. The Sunday races overlapped with Bethany's Sunday evening services, and the windows of the church could not be opened during the races 
because of the noise of the race cars and the billows of red dusty dirt that would drift towards the church. In January 1952, the church adopted the name of Bethany Mennonite Brethren in Christ. And by 1953, the congregation had outgrown its 1880 church building and plans were underway for a major construction project. A March, March 1st, 1954 North Penn Reporter newspaper article stated, Bethany MBC Church Hatfield held a groundbreaking service yesterday afternoon for a new church. The new church building will be 50 feet by 85 feet and will break all precedents of the MBC denomination with a baptismal pool included in the construction plans. But there was one big problem that had to be resolved before the construction of the new building could begin. There was a cemetery in the way. Here's a great aerial view from around 1914 that shows the church hidden in the trees there in the lower right hand corner. You can see a small piece of West Broad Street also in that corner. And you can also see the tombstones in the cemetery right behind the church. The first burial was made in this cemetery in 1885. And the first burial and the final burial took place here in 1935. In total, 18 people were interred here, although in 1929, the bodies of the four children of Mr. and Mrs. Enos Creevel were removed and reinterred in Hatfield Cemetery. So before construction of a church addition could begin, the cemetery had to be moved. This was no simple task. The laws governing the exhumation of human remains are very strict. Every effort had to be made to contact the next of kin of the deceased and obtain written permission to move the bodies. This task itself took nine months to accomplish. It took another three months to find a contractor with a backhoe who was willing to work on this unusual job. Most were very uneasy about disturbing bodies from their graves. The law also required that a mortician be present for the procedure, and Hatfield's Ziegler Cope filled the bill. Next of kin were advised of the planned date and time of the exhumation and invited to attend. Simple pine boxes had been procured in which the disinterred remains were to be reinterred. On a beautiful sunny day in July of 1954, the backhoe operator arrived, ready to, be, ready to begin this unusual procedure. Only one relative came to witness the event. Now remember, this was a time before burial vaults, and this was a low, wet piece of ground. As a result, there was much decomposition of both pine boxes and bodies. For several people, there were only a few bones and some discolored soil found. For the only one that had a relative attend, there was nothing found. The few remains that were recovered were then reinterred in the eastern edge of the church parking lot. Later, however, the parking lot was expanded, and so the 14-person cemetery plot is now a somewhat curious looking island in the middle of the parking lot, <laughs> surrounded by blacktop. A single plaque lists the 14 names of those buried there. With the cemetery moved, construction was commenced and the dedication of the new building occurred on New Year's Day of 1955. This photo shows the new addition on the left and the original 1880 church building on the right. By the late 1950s, the name of the denomination 
Mennonite brethren in Christ, was causing confusion to many people. Since the group of churches was no longer truly Mennonite, nor <laughs> brethren, it was decided to select a name more representative of the church body. The choice was between United Bible Church and Bible Fellowship Church. The latter name was chosen, and in March of 1960, the local church officially changed its name to Bethany Bible Fellowship Church. On March 2nd, 1966, the Bethany Church family and the community was shocked by the sudden death of one of its leaders. Daniel K. Ziegler and his wife, Carolyn Stout Ziegler, had just returned from a trip with Wycliffe Bible translators, and Mr. Ziegler was speaking in the front of the sanctuary, preparing to show slides and tell about the trip when he suddenly suffered a fatal heart attack. In April of 1979, the congregation voted to undertake a major renovation project that included adding a second floor to the original 1880 church building and redesigning the first floor of the 100-year-old building so that it could function as a fellowship hall, complete with kitchen and restroom facilities. In January 1990, Howard Wells was officially called to serve as pastor at Bethany, and of course he continues in that role today, starting his 30th year. By 1995, the large water tower next to the church had become obsolete and was dismantled. The North Penn Water Authority offered to sell the land back to Bethany. The land that Bethany sold in 1940 for $225 was rebought at a cost of $2,500. Most recently, the church expanded again when it built a large addition onto the right side of the building to serve as a family life center and gymnasium. Emmanuel Evangelical Congregational Church at Main Street and Lincoln Avenue had its origins back with the Orvilla Evangelical Association Church. As I mentioned earlier, the Evangelical Association Church experienced division within the denomination and within the Hatfield Church. For a number of years, both groups continued to use the Orvilla Church. But in 1894, according to a newspaper article, one group, the majority group, was deprived use of the building. So that group, only 16 in number, purchased a small plot of land on Cowpath Road in the tiny village of Hatfield. Here they built a church which was described in one newspaper account as, quote, one, a solid one-story brick building, 32 by 48, with pulpit recess and vestibule and a cellar under the whole building. It has a hip ceiling being 17 feet in the clear, with brackets finished in hardwood, making it substantial and ornamental. The furniture is neat and comfortable, and in brief, it is a place where body and mind can unhindered dwell upon spiritual things. A large size novelty heater in the cellar is sufficient to heat satisfactory in the coldest weather. The cost of the church, including the lot, is about $1,900, towards, towards which there has been sub subscribed and paid about $1,400. The balance will be, will be provided for in the near future, it is hoped." End quote. On Sunday, February 3rd, 1895, dedication services were held for the new Emmanuel United Evangelical Church. As mentioned earlier, in 1922, 31 years after the division, a United Evangelical Denomination, 
and the Evangelical Association denominations decided to reunite once again. There were some United Evangelical Churches, however, that rejected this reunification, desiring to maintain the doctrine and practices of the United Evangelical Denomination. Hatfield was among the congregations which chose to remain United Evangelical. In 1928, the name of the denomination was changed to Evangelical Congregational, which name continues in use today. In 1950, the congregation was incorporated as Emmanuel Evangelical Congregational Church. Through the years, various phys physical improvements has, have been made to the church. The basement under the sanctuary was dug out in the late 1920s to make room for Sunday schools, and shortly after celebrating the church's 50th anniversary in 1945, stained glass windows were installed, greatly enhancing the beauty of the sanctuary. In 1949, 115 South Main Street, which is the right side of this twin, became available. Both Emmanuel Church and Grace Lutheran showed interest in the house for a parsonage, but Grace Lutheran decided it would be closer and better for Emmanuel Church, so Emmanuel purchased it. This 1971 photo shows Reverend Gregory F. Dimmick and his young family shortly after he was assigned to minister at the Hatfield Church. In the spring of 1981, the church purchased the Gerhardt home at 20 West Lincoln Avenue, directly behind the church. This house became the new parsonage and the South Main Street uh, building was, was sold. In September 1983, a two-story addition for Sunday school rooms and a fellowship hall was dedicated. And then in 1997, the property just south of the church, the Stern property, seen here next to the church, became available and was purchased by the church. The house was soon demolished to provide some open outdoor space for the church. In 2004, Reverend Greg Dimmick retired from Emmanuel E.C. Church after serving there for 33 years, one of the longest single charge tenures in denominational history. Emmanuel E.C. Church holds the distinction of being the oldest continuing church in Hatfield Borough. The most numerous denomination in Montgomery County, reported in the census of 1870, was Lutheran, with 25 houses of worship in the county. Before 1899, Hatfield Luther Lutherans would travel to the Lutheran Church in Hilltown, Bucks County, for services. In 1899, so many Lutherans were making the trip from, Hill, from Hatfield to Hilltown that the Hilltown Lutheran pastor suggested that the Hatfield Lutherans have their own church. The first service of Hatfield Lutherans was held in Knight's Hall on the second floor of Knight's, Knight's Barn on October 8, 1899, with the Hilltown pastor leading in worship. Two weeks later, a Sunday school was organized. The congregation managed to raise sufficient funds in 1900 to purchase its first organ at a cost of $33. Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hatfield, PA was officially organized on May 12, 1904 with 32 charter members. Within three weeks, on June 1st, a lot on West Broad Street in Hatfield Borough was purchased for $300, and on October 2nd of that same year, a cornerstone was laid for Hatfield's first Lutheran church.
In the summer of 1905, the first services were held in the new building, and it was dedicated on October 27th of that year. It was an impressive building with three entrances, a large oil chandelier in the middle of the sanctuary, curved walnut pews, stained glass windows, and a handsome velvet carpet, according to a newspaper account. A bell was given by St. Peter's Lutheran Church in North Wales to be hung in the bell tower. The total cost of the new church and lot was $6,200. Although electricity came to Hatfield Borough in December of 1908, it wasn't until 1910 that the church replaced its oil lights with electric lights. Apparently the change was quite welcome though, since the oil chandelier never did quite work too well, requiring an elaborate pulley system to light the fixture each time. In January 1912, an additional lot was purchased behind the church, and two years later, in 1914, a, a small building was erected on the rear of that lot by the Dorcas Society. The Dorcas Society was a group of about nine women who met once a week to make quilts, and they used a sm small building as a sewing room. On April 27, 1915, the church purchased a lot on the Hatfield Saracen Pike to serve as its cemetery. Four Belgian block piers were built as, at the entrance, together with two small gates and two larger gates, with the name Hatfield Cemetery on the large gates. These were torn down and discarded about 40 years later. I know how I wish I had a picture of those original gates, if anybody happens to have one. I'd be glad to have a copy. The first burial in the cemetery was that of John Moore on September 16, 1916. Grace Lutheran Church united with Christ Lutheran Church in Culpsville to form a new parish, and Reverend H.A. Weaver was called as the new pastor. He began his duties in June 1919. With this arrangement, Grace Church was able to have worship every Sunday, one week in the morning and the next week in the evening. Previous to this, services were held only every other week in the evening. In 1941, Reverend Kern was assigned to assist Pastor Weaver, making it possible for there to be a morning service every Sunday at Grace Lutheran. In 1946, Reverend William A. Fluck was called to become the first full-time pastor at Grace Lutheran. As a separate congregation with its own pastor, Grace began to grow rapidly. Many new houses were being built in Hatfield Borough and in the surrounding township. The membership increased rapidly and the church and Sunday school soon taxed the capacity of the church building. The Sunday school had grown so much by 1949 that it became necessary to convert the basement of the church uh, into a classroom space and a social room. At a congregational meeting in January 1953, it was decided to enlarge the church building to accommodate the growing membership. And in June of 1954, the 50th anniversary year, Ground was broken for a new addition to the church and the rebuilding of the tower. The addition and the new tower were dedicated on June 5th, 1955. On October 1953, a plot of ground to the rear of the church was purchased with the intention to use it for a parking lot and to provide room for possible future expansion. This is the 1954 confirmation class at Grace. That's Pastor Fluck on the right. You may recognize a few other folks. Our own Kitty Heckler is second from the left. And you may recognize a few others. Pastor Fluck retired in 1957 after almost 11 and a half years of service to Grace. 
This 1972 photo shows Reverend Donald Schaefer, who started his pastorate at Grace in February 1965. And he's standing next to Mrs. Ava Freeman. Joining them are some of Mrs. Mrs. Freeman's family, celebrating her many years of service in the choir. In 1970, the church started nursery school to provide a much-needed service to the community. And in July 1972, Pastor Schaefer ended his ministry at Grace Church. Reverend Andrew D. Fisher soon answered the call to become pastor of Grace. In 1980, a daycare program was added to the nursery program to serve school-age children before and after school. Shortly thereafter, the daycare was expanded to year-round and to include preschool children as well. In 1984, after the unfortunate accidental death of Pastor Fisher the previous year, Reverend Robert I. Hopkins was chosen as Pastor of Grace. In April of 1989, work began on a new sanctuary building behind the old original church. The old Dorcas building, seen here on the left side, was torn down to make way for the new building. Construction was completed and the new sanctuary was dedicated in April 1990. The original church building was then used for Christian education. On New Year's Eve 2011, a fire broke out in the old original church building. The flames spread quickly through the 100-year-old building, completely destroying it. Fortunately, the fire did not spread to the new sanctuary building. By morning, New Year's Day, not much was left intact of the old church except for the old brick walls. What was left of the old building was eventually demolished and after much work and planning, construction of a new Christian education building was completed and dedicated in February 2017. There's no mention in any history books about where Hatfield's Reformed Church folks may have met prior to 1899. The first mention of the Reformed Church in Hatfield is when they held their first worship service in Knights Hall, just like the Lutherans did. This ser first service was held on February 19, 1899, and they continued to meet there until January 1901, when services were moved to Slaughter's Hall in the South Hatfield Hat Hotel building on South Main Street, which is now the main hotel. This photo of the hotel was taken around 1903. The cornerstone of the first church building, located at 30 East Lincoln Avenue, was laid in October 1901. This building, erected by the donated labor of the members at a cost of about $6,000 and with no basement, was dedicated and put into use in May 1902. There was no electric service at that time in Hatfield Borough, so illumination was by kerosene lamps fastened to the walls. There were no water or toilet facilities either though a double privy was located at the rear of the church lot. The windows were plain glass painted in a diagonal pattern. Heat was from a warm air heater in a pit beneath the floor. Initially, the church used a pedal pump organ for music accompaniment, adding a piano later. In its beginning, because of its small size, Heidelberg Church had a supply preacher whose chief responsibility was to another congregation. So similar to Grace Lutheran, members of Heidelberg Church would have services on Sunday afternoon one week and on Sunday evening the next week. After many years with this schedule, a new pastor was acquired on a full-time basis so the congregation was finally able to have both morning and evening services each and every Sunday. 
By 1925, the Heidelberg Reformed Church had a membership of more than 150. In March 1935, the congregation was incorporated under the name Heidelberg Evangelical and Reformed Church. In 1937, the church purchased a small bungalow next to the church building from Leroy and Lavinia Clemens that building seen there, which was used as a Sunday school annex. By the way, this little bungalow originally served as the home of the Hatfield Post Office from 1914 to 1922. In 1942, the church building was extensively remodeled. The sloping floor of the sanctuary was leveled an addition was added to the rear of the church building for restrooms, a steam heating system was installed, and a new organ and piano installed. This 1944 photo shows Reverend Walter Clark standing in front of the church shortly after he was called to fill the, pul fill the pulpit at Heidelberg. Also in 1944, Heidelberg Church started the tradition of playing Christmas carols over a loudspeaker system. Various churches, individuals, and organizations would provide recorded music, recorded music which was broadcast from a public address system in the tower of the old borough schoolhouse. From here, the music was enjoyed throughout the borough. This tradition continued until around 1952. <coughs> In March 1958, the church purchased a house at the corner of East Lincoln Avenue and Poplar Street from Jacob Gottschall, with the intention of using the property as part of a planned long-range building program. Later that year, in September 1958, Reverend John Light accepted the call to serve as pastor for Heidelberg. Soon after, discussions and planning for expansion of the church building began. These plans soon included discussions on whether it would be better to build a new church elsewhere than to expand the present building. In a letter to the congregation, it was stated, quote, East Lincoln Avenue is not an attractive neighborhood for a church. We are across from a factory and a garage and only a few hundred feet from a tavern." End quote. In 1959, after much deliberation, it was decided not to expand the Lincoln Avenue church facilities, but instead to purchase a 23-acre tract of land the Serza Becker Farm on Calpath Road in Hatfield Township, on which to build a new church in the future. It was noted that the new location, quote, would be in a residential area near the new A.M. Colt School and directly across from the new location of the highway home for the agent, end quote. Side note here, the, the highway home had purchased the large Munsinger farm across the Catbath Road some years earlier with plans to move there from its home in the borough, but of course that never did happen. In 1960, the name of the congregation was changed to Heidelberg United Church of Christ to conform with the denominational change created by the merger of the Evangelical and Reformed Church and the Congregational Christian Churches. This photo of the inside of the church was taken a year earlier in 1959 for the church calendar. <clears throat> in, October, in October 1966, following the morning worship service at the church on East Lincoln Avenue, the congregation went to the church's new Cowpath Road property for a groundbreaking ceremony. And on November 5th of the following year, the new church building was dedicated. This was a great day for Heidelberg Church 
with attendance of 310 people. A month later, the congregation approved the sale of all of the Heidelberg's properties in the borough for $35,000. This included the old church building, the parking lot, and the two houses at the corner of East Lincoln Avenue and Poplar Street. Proceeds from the sale of the property were applied to the mortgage on the new church property. Apartments were soon built on the parking lot, and the two houses were demolished and replaced by an open pantry convenience store. The old church building was turned into a combination business and residence for many years. More recently, the church was once again a place of worship when an Egyptian Coptic or Christian church purchased it to use as a temporary worship facility. The church contents and church bell were not included in the sale of the old church, and the bell now stands in the narthex of the new church and I believe is told at the beginning of each church service. This bell weighs 1,800 pounds and was manufactured in New York in 1905. It was brought to Hatfield by train and then transported to the Lincoln Avenue Church by horse-drawn wagon. Well, those are Hatfield's earlier churches, all established before the 20th century. Now briefly, I would like to talk about Hatfield's 20th century churches. You still with me out there? <laughs> In 1932, after the Evangelical Association had discontinued services at its Orvilla Road Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church bought the building and one half acre lot on which it stands. By the early 1950s, the congregation required more space and the addition was built onto the 1876 building. There's an interesting uh, date stone on the front of the 1876 church, apparently put there in 1954. It reads, Orvilla Chapel, 1867 to 1954. This is interesting because all historical accounts list 1876 as the date the church was built, and I'm not sure the significance of the 1954 date, except that it was possibly the year that the addition to the church was constructed. The Seventh-day Adventist Church continued using this building until 1969, after which they moved to a new building on Troxel Road in Tomlinson Township. Another church for which there is very little information is the Hatfield Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses Kingdom Hall was located at 1521 Schwab Road. The congregation met there beginning in the 1940s, and in the 1950s the congregation then relocated to Lansdale. This photo was taken in August 1945. The building, now a residence, is still there and looks pretty much the same. That is Schwab Road, just a small stone road at that time passing just a few feet from the front of the building. It was around 1920 that a group of local worshippers, mainly Mennonites, became disillusioned by all the infighting within the Mennonite denomination. And they left the church. One member of the group reportedly said, or, quote, originally there was one Mennonite church. Now there are 20 or 30. That's discouraging some of the people, end quote. The group first met in people's homes, and later, around 1951, they, bega they began meeting in a garage on Diamond Street here in Hatfield Borough. The tiny converted garage, the Diamond Street Chapel, served for many years as a place of worship for this small but dedicated congregation. The only way a passerby would know that the building was a house of worship 
was the small sign swinging from an outside bracket which read, Diamond Street Chapel, all welcome. Inside the tiny chapel were about 30 chairs, a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling, one bookcase, an old fashioned sink, a fan, a portable heater, and a simple lectern with a light. The Diamond Street Chapel discontinued its services in the mid 1980s. Most of the early settlers of Pennsylvania were of Protestant faith. Just when the first Catholics settled in the area, we have no means of knowing, but it is known that many early Catholics, because there was no Catholic church in the area, often joined one of the other churches which had been established here. Those, however, who, had, who insisted on remaining Catholic were compelled to drive to Philadelphia or travel to Philadelphia. Uh, Haycock or Bethlehem, whichever place was most convenient to them for their baptisms, marriages, funerals, etc. This continued until around 1835 when the first congregation was started in Norristown and the house of worship built there the next year. When the Reading Railroad constructed its line from Philadelphia to Bethlehem in the mid 1800s, through Dansdale, Hatfield, and Salerton, it required the employment of many men for the construction and maintenance of the railroad. <coughs> During that same time, thousands of Irish, predominantly Roman Catholic, were fleeing their famine-stricken home country to America, and they often found work laboring on the railroad systems. The Catholic population had grown so much in the area by 1868 that a mission church was established in Sellersville. The pastor of the Haycock Catholic Church would travel to the St. Agnes Mission in Sellersville once a month for services. St. Stanislaus Church was founded about 10 years later in 1876 to serve the growing Catholic population of the area. The St. Maria Goretti Parish or St. Marie Gretty Parish, as it was known when I was growing up, was started in 1953, with Father Thomas Doyle as the first pastor. On June 14th of that year, the first Mass was celebrated in the Hatfield Firehouse. This is the firehouse as it appeared in 1959. The following Sunday, and for 18 months thereafter, the congregation celebrated Masses in the banquet hall of Hen's Restaurant, which later became the Coventry Inn on the Hatfield Saturton Pike. Ground was broken in December 1953 for a combination church school building and a convent building for the sisters. The school opened in September 1954. Around 1961, a small social hall and gym were added, and services began to be held in these rooms. This was to be only a temporary situation, but these rooms would continue to serve as the parish church for the next 34 years. Finally, in May 1994, ground was broken for a new church building, and in July 1995, the building was ready for partial use. After 34 years in the temporary church, the new church was dedicated on Sunday, November 19, 1995. And when I was working on this program, I was shocked to realize that it's been 23 years since the new church was built. Time certainly flies. In January 1969, the North Penn Baptist Church purchased the Orbilla Church building from the Seventh-day Adventist. The church again changed hands in 1991 when the Spirit of Christ Church purchased it and operated briefly there until 1995. And finally, in 1995, the Holy Spirit Anglican Church took over the building and has been there ever since. 
I hear a forty woodpecker. <laughs> One other old religious group I want to mention briefly, even though they never established a church in Hatfield, is the Schwenkfelders. The early Montgomery County Schwenkfelders mostly settled in the Salford, Tomlinson, and Worcester towns areas, but not so much here in Hatfield. Two notable exceptions were the Anders and Davis families of Hatfield. You may recall from other presentations the name of Joseph P. Anders. Joe Anders operated the South Hatfield store and post office at Main and Vine Streets in the early 1900s and was a major turkey dealer in the area. This picture shows Mr. Anders at the right front posing with his large family on the front steps of the South Hatfield store. Joe's daughter, Edith, the little girl front and center, would later marry Horace Inky Davis, also a Schwenkfelder. So the Schwenkfelders were represented here in Hatfield. In the past 20 years or so, Hatfield and the surrounding area have be certainly become more diversified. Here in Hatfield, there is now a Hindu temple, temple a Muslim mosque, and recently it seems that a rather large population of Christian Egyptians has found it favorable to live in this area, and as you probably know, they are in the process of building a church out on Unionville Pike, right outside the borough. Interestingly, the closest Jewish synagogue is about a half an hour away, from what I understand. It is, I'm sure, no surprise to anyone that faith is on the decline in our country. Churches that were once filled to capacity every week often struggle just to keep the lights on. Sadly, faith today, especially for our younger population, is just not the priority it was with those who first settled this area. But there's always the hope that revival will occur and the day will come when our country will return to the faith of our fathers. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed this program and, and learned a lot of uh, history of Hatfield's churches, stuff you never knew before. Um, Please feel free to stay and enjoy fellowship with one another and the refreshments. Don't forget to stop up and sign the card for Dale. And again, thank you all for coming out this evening. We really appreciate it. Have a good night.